We are recording. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the appellate court. I am Judge Cradle, and I'm sitting today with Judge Suarez and Judge Baer. Uh, this is the matter of Black versus uh, the town of West Hartford, AC docket number 43918. This is a virtual argument that is being conducted on the Microsoft Teams platform. It is being live streamed on the Judicial Branch's YouTube channel, and the recording of this argument will be posted on the branch's website. To the extent there is any protected information involved in this case, it should not be disclosed, and I would remind you not to divulge that uh, information during your argument. Uh, to make sure that we can hear and see one another, I will ask everyone to introduce themselves, beginning with the judges, followed by counsel for the appellant, and then counsel for the appellee. I am Judge Cradle. I am Judge Suarez. Judge Baer. Kenneth Black, Plaintiff Appellant. And Assistant Attorney General Patrick Ring for OPM. Okay, and I can see and hear everyone. And if during the course of the argument you are not able to see or hear everyone, then please bring it to our attention. I'm going to ask that everyone mute their microphones when you're not speaking so that we don't have any feedback. You must also keep your camera on at all times during the argument so that we know that you're still present. Uh, if we have any questions, the judges will raise our hands. If you don't notice us raising our hands, then we will just uh, interrupt and ask the question. Everyone should be mindful that this is a court proceeding and everyone should conduct themselves as if they were present in the courtroom. Each side will be permitted 20 minutes of argument. The appellant may reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal. The appellant should tell me before he proceeds if you would like any rebuttal time, and if so, how much. I'm going to keep track of the time, so I will give you a warning. Uh, when you have two minutes left in your argument remaining, one minute left re remaining in your argument, and also when your time is up. You've each received instructions prior to today's argument. Does anyone have any questions? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay, then you may proceed, Mr. Black. May it please the court, I am Kenneth Black, the plaintiff appellant. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Okay, very well. This case brings into question one main issue, that is the misapplication of a statute by a state agency. Specifically, the State of Connecticut Office of Policy and Management, or OPM, issued an illegal schedule of motor vehicle values to municipal tax assessors for use in property tax assessment. This schedule of motor vehicle values was selected from the National Automobile Dealers Association, or NADA, guidebook from the clean retail category. The term clean retail is in direct contradiction to the plain language of Connecticut General Statutes, section 12-71D, which explicitly states that the average retail price shall represent the value of motor vehicles. Since clean is unequivocally a separate term than average and represents a motor vehicle in a condition better than average, it is evident that Mr. Black was issued a tax bill by the town of West Hartford in excess of what it should have been if his vehicle were considered average. This case was partially dismissed in the trial court as OPM's motion to dismiss was granted on the grounds that sovereign immunity prevents the state from being sued without its consent. However, as briefed, there are numerous cases that address exceptions to sovereign immunity. One such case is Allen v. Commissioner of Revenue Services that mentions in part that sovereign immunity is overcome when, quote, the state or its officers act in excess of statutory authority, unquote. While it is true that the words in excess of statutory authority do not appear in my complaint, the Supreme Court case Miller v. Egan directly addresses that although the plaintiff did not allege in his complaint that the defendants had acted in excess of statutory authority, the trial court in denying the defendant's motion to dismiss concluded that the factual allegations of the complaint, if proven, were sufficient to establish that the defendant's conduct was sufficiently egregious so as to con constitute conduct that was in excess of their statutory authority. Here, I pleaded in the complaint on page two, numbered paragraph seven, that, quote, the defendants are not following Connecticut General Statute section 12-71D, 
by basing the motor vehicle tax on the National Automobile Dealers Association clean retail value instead of the plain language of Section 12-71D, which requires motor vehicle taxes to be based on the average retail price. While the trial court dismissed this case due to sovereign immunity, I recognize that the appellate court standard of review is de novo and, I, and consequently, I will entertain OPM's argument that subject matter jurisdiction is lacking because I did not exhaust administrative remedies. The legal management of state agencies is set forth under the Uniform Administrative Procedures Act, or UAPA. Section 4-176 um, allows any person to petition an agency requesting the promulgation, amendment, or appeal of a regulation. The law goes on to mention that each agency shall adopt regulations in accordance with the provisions of this chapter that provide for one, the form and content of petitions for declaratory rulings, two, the filing procedures for such petitions, and three, the procedural rights with respect to the petitions. Here, there are no forms available from OPM to request a declaratory ruling, both on the repository of state regulations, the Secretary of State's e-regulations web service, and on OPM, OPM's website. However, I discovered an OPM webpage entitled Statutes Governing Property Assessment and Taxation, which states, for further information, contact Martin Heft, an OPM Policy and Development Coordinator, listing his phone number and email address. Yes, Your Honor. Judge Baer, you are on mute. Um, starting, if you will, at the beginning, uh, the state has raised, uh, although it's raised as an alternative uh, basis for uh, firming uh, the trial court's decision, the issue of your standing. And under our law, if standing is raised, uh, it can be considered at any time. So I'd like you, uh, please, to address uh, the uh, issue raised in uh, the, the OPM brief that uh, you don't have standing uh, because you don't have a claim that's uh, different in any way from the typical so-called taxpayer uh, uh, basis for suit, which is something that we haven't uh, really considered to be a proper basis for standing. So if you would, please. Sure. Yeah, th this is um, not a taxpayer standing uh, suit in, in broad applicability. This is a suit that directly affected me where the town of West Hartford specifically assessed my motor vehicle value um, at a price above average, and I consequently um, was issued a tax bill and subsequently paid the tax bill, appealed, and am now um, bringing to court the issue. Okay, but uh, I think that, and I, I won't speak for Attorney Ring, but just in general, our, our law is you have to have a specific individual personal kind of interest that's different than the general public uh, or in this case uh, all other uh, owners of motor vehicles uh, uh, that are not commercial motor vehicles and uh, and how how do you meet that kind of standard that's part of our jurisprudence well the clean retail value, which OPM directed to the town of West Hartford, um, is contrary to the plain language of the statute and was directly applied to my motor vehicle valuation. And um, under my uh, discovery of, of this fact, I, I, I knew that this happened, that I, I don't know if this was applied to everybody's motor vehicle, but um, specifically that for my vehicle, I received a excessive valuation um, that was contrary to the law. 
But but as you, uh, I think, uh, have just said, based on what you've said, do you have standing that's different from anybody else uh, or everyone else uh, who's in the same position in the town or city of West Hartford? I, I, I don't know if their motor vehicle values were um, assessed the same as mine. I believe Thank that the schedule does not have motor vehicle values for every single vehicle available in the town of West Hartford, and that is up to the town to decide. Okay, but based on what you've said, the standard used by the town or city of West Hartford is the clean retail value of any motor vehicle versus the average retail price. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Any motor vehicle um, shall be represented by the scheduled motor vehicle values uh, recommended by OPM. Thank you. P please proceed with your argument. So um, while, while there are no regulations provided from OPM to request a declaratory ruling, um, I found a web page entitled Statutes Governing Property Tax, Property Assessment and Taxation, which states, for further information, contact Martin Heft, an OPM Policy and Development Coordinator, listing his phone number and email address. I pleaded communication with Martin Heft as attachment C to the complaint. Therefore, I did exhaust my administrative remedies the best I could in contacting Martin Heft. Regardless, case law provides in Connecticut Mobile Home Association versus Jensen's, where an administrative remedy does not exist or is inadequate, a party will be allowed to the court in the first instance. Bringing this case to Superior Court is therefore justified. Furthermore, Supreme Court case Neiman versus Yale University sets forth another exception to exhaustion, stating, one of the limited exceptions to the doctrine of exhaustion rule, it rises when recourse to the administrative remedy would be demonstrably futile or inadequate. It is well established that an administrative remedy is futile or ina inadequate if the agency is without authority to gr grant the requested relief. Herein lies a justicable just controversy between the state and the town of West Hartford, where the town of West Hartford says it's a requirement for them to follow OPM's uh, schedule of motor vehicle values, but OPM consequently states that um, it is up to the town to apply their discretion in use of that schedule. So I'm caught in the middle between this dispute and uh, consequently my motor vehicle valuation was uh, above average. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, that that is another reason why it's different, because the, the state and the town are, are arguing and, and there's an obvious controversy. Advancing this case will unburden the judicial system since I can file a suit each year so long as OPM continues to issue this schedule of motor vehicle values in contradiction to the plain language of the law. And I yield my time. Okay, I can add that time uh, to your rebuttal time if you choose to do that. Okay. Okay. All right, Attorney Ring. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good, good afternoon, and may it please the court. I'm Assistant Attorney General Patrick Ring, and I represent the Office of Policy and Management. And I have three main points that I'd like to address here. Um, the first is that the judgment should be affirmed because the trial court correctly concluded that sovereign immunity barred the plaintiff's claims against the OPM. The plaintiff was required to make a substantial allegation that a state official acted in excess of his or her statutory authority, and he did not do that here. Second, the judgment may be affirmed because the plaintiff failed to establish aggrievement or standing. Uh, the plaintiff did not allege an actual harm caused by any actions taken by OPM as seen in his complaint. Um, and without aggrievement, the plaintiff's claims against OPM simply fail. And third, the judgment may be affirmed because the plaintiff did not exhaust his administrative remedies under the UAPA. 
And even if this court were willing to look beyond the plaintiff's, the allegations in the plaintiff's complaint, he still did not exhaust, nor did he file a timely action against OPM. And absent compliance with those UAPA procedures, the plaintiff's claims against OPM also failed. So uh, turning first to sovereign immunity, I think the analysis is fairly straightforward as Judge Cobb's uh, order indicates. To un overcome sovereign immunity, an action for declaratory relief must allege that the state officer acted in excess of statutory authority and the plaintiff never alleged that a state officer at OPM acted in excess of his or her statutory authority and therefore as stated in this court's decisions in Ware and Hanna, the in excess analysis is simply irrelevant. Um, also, the plaintiff must make a substantial allegation of wrongful conduct by a state official to promote an illegal purpose. And again, looking through the complaint, I don't see an allegation of wrongful conduct by any person at all, and let alone one that caused him any specific harm. As Judge Bear indicated, he has to indi he has to demonstrate. The plaintiff has to demonstrate standing. It has to be not only just a, an interest personal to him, but that that interest was harm and his complaint does not have that. And then also in excess, the in excess analysis requires that the plaintiff at least allege that a state employee has acted solely to further his or, ho his or her own illegal scheme and not to carry out government policy. And again, I, that's just simply not in his complaint. Um, if I turn to aggrievement, the plaintiff was required to establish, as I had said before, a specific personal legal interest and in that this interest has been specially harmed by the challenged action. And again, the complaint does not allege an actual harm. I mean, he I think he wants people to infer that he was harmed, but I don't see any allegation in the complaint that there was actual harm. So absent that kind of theory of liability, the plaintiff has failed to establish aggrievement and uh, the claims are entirely speculative. And then finally, turning to exhaustion, I, I disagree with the plaintiffs. First, first, I just want to disagree with the plaintiff's allegations that he sufficiently pled exhaustion. I just looked at his complaint again. I didn't see any attachment in the complaint that was an e that was the email from him to Mr. Heft at OPM. I, I know that information came out afterwards when we were briefing on the motion to dismiss, but it, it was not part of the complaint. So as far as looking at the four corners of the complaint, I don't, he did not adequately or at all plead that he exhausted his administrative remedies under the UAPA. He did plead that he exhausted with respect to the town and finally municipal, you know, his municipal tax challenge, but he did not plead that with respect to OPM. And, you know, as this court is aware, there's a whole statutory procedure for uh, seeking declaratory relief uh, against the state agency. And he, he did not plead that. He tried to bring this up on the motion to dismiss, uh, you know, and, and if, even if the court were willing to look beyond his pleading, I simply don't think that that uh, he, the emails that he sent to Mr. Heft satisfy the standard for what is considered a petition for declaratory ru uh, ruling. And with respect to his futility argument, again, you know, we, I, that, that was not pled. And futility in the context of agency relief means that the agency is not able to provide him with the relief he requested. But he never requested this from OPM in the first place. And they can provide relief. They can issue a declaratory ruling, despite the fact that they might not have regulations about the form and the content, as as Mr. Black stated. But in our view, that that really goes against OPM. I mean, I have other clients. I've looked again. I've looked at what their regulations are, and when they when they say the content, the form, it's usually you know you have to send it to this person at the agency if you want a petition. You have to. It has to be in writing. It has to be a letter. So to me, what that would mean is that oh, if OPM does not have a regulation saying that, then an email would be fine, whereas maybe it's not fine with another agency. But it does not take away Mr. Black's right to actually ask for the ruling because he has that right under the UAPA and the agency can't take away that right by failing to promulgate some regulation. So. Um, that's I mean, those are the three main points I wanted to, to raise to the court. I don't know if there are any questions. 
Um, if not, then for the foregoing reasons, I would, and for the reasons set forth in my brief, I would just ask that this court affirm the judgment of the trial court. Okay, seeing no further questions, Mr. Black, uh, you have nine minutes remaining. Sure. I would like to address the aggrievement issue. Um, this was briefed uh, in the proceedings with the trial court. Um, and as a matter of fact, I uh, stated facts in my complaint and um, specifically the attachment C to the complaint uh, from Martin Heft, uh, communication from Martin Heft is evidence that I communicated with, with Martin Heft. I did not receive this. Uh, I mean, I could not find this anywhere. Um, and I uh, concede that it was not in proper form to um, later um, include the email correspondence in my objection to the motion to dismiss um, that showed the attachment um, originated from an email correspondence with the state agency. But the fact is that I uh, pled in the complaint uh, correspondence with OPM and um, attachment C again is, is the, the letter to um, municipalities that states that the clean retail value should be used. Um, again, I would say that um, the, the complaint has to be read broadly and realistically and um, by necessary force of implication, I, I believe that agreement is established. Um, it is you know, clear that uh, I believe that the the defendant is not applying the statute correctly and um, is discretionary and they used uh, clean retail, which is not average retail. Um, again, the substantial allegation of Rockville doing um, this will be applied to me year after year so long as OPM chooses to assess my motor vehicle in such a manner. Um, and I'm not I'm not arguing the actual tax. I think it's important to stress that I'm um, arguing against the assessment, the valuation of my motor vehicle. Um, I happen to notice that um, this was the third uh, motor vehicle tax I received on my vehicle. Um, the first year it was based on the assessed value of MSRP. The second year it was above MSRP, which I thought was pretty unusual. And then the third year, um, which is the year that I filed this um, uh, case, it, uh, it only had a uh, less than 2% drop in the MSRP. So that's really what made me question this, this, this law and, and how they derive this price. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's evident that clean is, is unequivocally different than average. It represents a, a motor vehicle in an above uh, average condition. And there, what what other uh, regulation is holding um, OPM to to issue uh, a motor vehicle valuation based on average retail price, other than that one specific statute? Um, in regards to the the exhaustion of administrative remedies, um, there are no forms or petitions to request a declaratory ruling. So I don't know how I would have been able to know the form, the content, who to send it to, um, et cetera. I, I tried my best. I found uh, the most relevant web page and contacted Martin Heft. And again, um, I improperly pled that in an objection. But what I thought was the most sub substantive part uh, result of that email conversation was, was correctly pled as attachment C. Um, and yeah, uh, again, any possible administrative remedies would be futile and inadequate because OPM recommends um, this schedule of motor vehicle values in October of the preceding year to when the tax is issued. Therefore, um, I suffered no harm at the time that OPM issued this motor vehicle schedule because I did not receive a tax bill from the town of West Hartford until July of the following year. Are there any questions or? Any further questions? Seeing none, Mr. Black, does that finish your argument? 
I believe it does. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to thank both parties uh, for being before the appellate court today. We will take this matter under advisement and we will stand in recess until 3 p.m. Thank you, Your Honor.